Welcome to Request for Inspection. Sit back, relax, and concentrate, as the coming crime recap is not for the faint hearted. Meet Yu Young Chul, who is probably better known as the Raincoat Killer, or one of South Korea's most prolific serial killers in history. He had actively slaughtered at least 20 people in Seoul, the capital of South Korea, between September 2003 and July 2004, less than a one year killing spree. Yu broke into four wealthy, elderly people's homes in late 2003 and killed the occupants by bludgeoning them with his weapon of choice, a personalized hammer. He then proceeded to stage the crime scenes, as robbery-motivated killings. Besides targeting the rich elderly residents of Seoul, Yu also started targeting prostitutes and escort girls, killing at least 11 women between May and July of 2004, by luring them to his office tell, beating them with his hammer and then dismembering their bodies. In South Korea, an office tell is a multi-purpose building with residential and commercial units. This is a type of studio apartment or studio flat. Yu Young Chul claimed to have killed 26 people in his personal confessions, but was ultimately convicted of only 20 murders, and other serious offenses. He was sentenced to death and is still on death row at the Seoul Detention Center. Yu Young Chul's preference for targeting the wealthy and old, has been attributed to the gap between socio-economic classes in Korea, as a result of the country's 1997 financial crisis. Yu grew up in a poor family in Ga Chong, South Korea, and was tormented by his friends because of his family's financial situation. The financial crisis worsened his childhood feelings of rage and hatred. Incredibly, Yu had an extensive criminal record predating his killing spree. In 1988, 1991 and 1993 he was arrested for theft. Along with his pattern of theft, he was caught selling child pornography in 1995, and in 1998 was sentenced to two years in prison for theft, identity theft, and forgery. You would also pose as a police officer, with a fake ID and extort money from people. He ended up spending most of his 20s, in and out of prison. In 2000 he was also arrested for the rape of a 15-year-old girl, receiving a sentence of three years and six months. You had married a woman in 1991 and had a son. However, it was short-lived and she divorced him in October 2000, presumably when his rape conviction meant he was to be imprisoned. Yu was released from prison on the 11th of September 2003. Just two weeks after his release, Yu began what would be a series of gruesome murders that would forever change South Korea. Yu Young Chul, killed a total of nine senior citizens of wealthy status throughout late 2003. His weapons and tools for carrying out these murders included a customized hammer, jackknife and gloves. September, 2003, Since a Dong Murders. Phase 1 of the Raincoat Killer. Around 10.10 10 a.m. on 24 September, Yu broke into a wealthy couple's home in Sinsadong, belonging to university professor 73-year-old, Lee Deok Su, and his 68-year-old wife, Lee Yoon Ok. Deok Su was stabbed in the neck with a knife, and then Yu proceeded to bludgeon the two to death with his customized hammer. The hammer Yu used throughout his many murders, was one that he had made to fit his grip by replacing the standard long handle with a shorter one, and filled in the gaps with silicone. Before leaving the scene he wiped down everything, and staged the scene to look like a robbery motivated murder by trashing the couple's closet, without actually taking anything. He then locked the front door and exited via the main gate. He realized he left behind his knife so he smashed the doorknob, retraced his steps and retrieved the knife. Police found shoe prints at this scene that would eventually be linked to his next murders. In Korea they keep evidence such as shoe prints in a database, this would prove to be critical in the investigation to come. October, 2003, Gugidong Murders Yu broke into a house in Gugidong around 10.40 am on October 9. He first came across the grandmother, 85-year-old, Mo Kang, and smashed her head with his hammer and stabbed her. The homeowner's wife, 60-year-old, Li Mo, came down the stairs and saw the scene in front of her. Shocked as she was, being an elderly lady you can imagine she would just freeze on the spot. You threatened her and sat her on the sofa, asking, who was upstairs? To which she replied her husband and son. He told her to bow her head but when she didn't, he kicked her in the stomach and bludgeoned her head. The 34-year-old son, came down the stairs, but you dragged him back up, forcing him to kneel and then hammered him to death. You continued through the house to try to find the husband who was not actually home at the time. 
He then proceeded with his robbery staging of the scene, trying to make the safe appear to be broken into. Shoe prints were also found at the scene and police began searching their database. October, 2003, The Samsung Dong Murders On the 16th of October, Yu killed 69-year-old, Yu Jun Hee, who was the wife of a millionaire, after breaking into their house in Samsung Dong around 12.30 p.m. After asking her, if anyone else was home? To which she replied there wasn't, he dragged her into the bathroom and bashed her head with his hammer. She was still alive around an hour later, when she was found by her son, but died of her injuries after being taken to hospital. In these crimes so far, we can clearly see that Yu was enjoying his actions of taking lives. It must have made him feel powerful and provided a release on his anger at his personal past. November, 2003, The Haiwa Dong Murders Yu Young Chul continued his killing spree by forcing entry into a home at around 11 am in Haiwa Dong. He was faced with the 57-year-old housekeeper, Bei Jie. Bei asked him who he was, and then he showed her his knife, demanding to know where the master bedroom was. 87-year-old, Kim jong suk the homeowner, was found by Yu in the master bedroom, lying in bed. Again as his previous killings, Yu bludgeoned him to death with his hammer. Meanwhile, the housekeeper was holding a baby, and was trying to keep it safe, however, Yu took the child from her, placed it on the sofa in the living room, and covered it with a blanket tightly to muffle the screams. He then returned to the master bedroom, where he hammered the housekeeper to death. In his typical fashion, Yu proceeded to stage the scene as a robbery, by trying to open the safe with a pickaxe, and pruning shears found at the residence. After accidentally cutting himself while trying to open a safe, and splitting the knuckle of his right middle finger, Yu set the house on fire to destroy any possible DNA evidence, by putting newspaper and clothes around Mrs. Bay, and lit them. The sheer cruelty of Yu was in full motion, as he had upped his game to include arson to eliminate evidence. This further showed his intelligence or skill set that his life of crimes had provided him with. He waited outside to see the house burn down but it didn't, however, it did destroy the bodies and the first floor bedroom. Later, the baby was rescued by Jiang Suk's daughter-in-law. The only clues that police had from this scene, were some shoe prints and CCTV footage of the perpetrator walking away, while wearing a sweater from the victim's closet, to hide the blood. A pause in the killings. Yu Young Chul moved to an office cell in Nogozen Dong, and continued posing as a police officer to extort money. Incredibly he kept low and avoided being caught or found out. At some point in late 2003, Yu began dating an escort girl. The two of them lived together for two months but once she discovered his criminal record, educational background, and previous marriage, she told you to never see her again. This event, in combination with his ex-wife who left him, is attributed by many to have inspired and or motivated his next killings, and the type of victims he selected. Clearly he had been scarred. March, 2004, Murder of Kwon Jin Hee. Phase 2 of the Raincoat Killer. March 2014 and the serial killer is seemingly back. You called for a business strip massage, or prostitution service, and posed as an officer that was catching out prostitutes. Quan Jin he answered the call out, and you took her to his place. This is where he fatally strangled her, and then began dismembering her corpse. His antics now reached all-time diabolical highs. He took her head, and hanged it on a garbage can to drain the blood, then sliced her arms, legs, and chest while the shower was running, and music was playing. It had to have been something straight out of a horror movie. He separated the dismembered bits into ten small black plastic bags, followed by four bigger black bags. You got a taxi, and left Jin He's remains on a trail, under a tree behind Sogang University's library, saving the bags in case of fingerprints. This is where Yu's killings start taking a much darker and twisted route, that would shock the entire country, when his killings came to light. April, 2004, A Break in the Pattern Unlike his murders of the rich elderly people and prostitutes, Yu murdered a street vendor, 44-year-old on Jae Sun on the 14th of April. Jae Sun was selling fake Viagra and porn in the Sam Young building. After finishing his work for the day, he returned to his Kia Besta van, where you confronted him with his phony ID and accused him of breaking the Pharmaceutical Affairs Act. He shackled him and placed him in Jay Sun's van's passenger seat. He grew concerned since he could detect fraudulent IDs, and Yu was driving his van alone and not with another police officer. Yu pulled into the Segong Orthopedic Surgery Clinic parking lot, 
seized Don's face, and stabbed him in the neck and head. He believed Jason was dead and laid him under the back seat but he then kicked you. You stabbed him in the thigh and tried to cover him with a bag, beating his head with his hammer a ridiculous 20 times. Because you cut himself during the ordeal, he decided to torch the van to destroy any evidence. He put newspapers and clothes over Jason, then went to his apartment to clean up and change clothes. After this, he drove to Wolmito, Inchon around 1 am and parked at Sam Ho Petroleum parking lot in Buksong Dong. He parked the car between two tanker trucks and tried to set off an explosion, which didn't work. However, this did successfully burn the car and the body. This particular murder is well reported for leaving the victim's family devastated. His two brothers committed suicide and the remaining brother attempted suicide and now lives with psychiatric treatment. May to July, 2004, a series of prostitute murders. The beginning of Yu's killing spree targeting women saw Yu Young Chul call for an escort girl, and convince her to come to his apartment as he did with Quan Jin in March. They had sex, but after she saw handcuffs she began to feel uncomfortable. Yu took her to the bathroom and tickled her playfully. She crouched in response and he then bludgeoned her unconscious with his hammer. A pattern can be seen in Yu's murders where he preferred to strike from above, with his victim kneeling or crouching and therefore in a vulnerable position. He would also tend to show affection and tenderness before killing his victims. He then decapitated her with his jackknife in the bathroom while she was still alive. Yu dismembered her body and also cut off her fingertips with scissors and flushed them down the toilet. Yu would come to mutilate his victims' bodies into 16 to 18 pieces. Her body was buried behind a construction site in Sodimun Gu. Yu carried out this method of slaughter to nine more prostitutes and escort girls, selectively choosing women who were on the slim and shorter side for ease of dismemberment and disposal. It is believed that his targeting of these women were due to his resentment towards his ex-wife who worked in a massage parlor, and his ex-girlfriend who was also a prostitute. Yu committed his last murder on the 13th of July, 2004. Caught. At last. Just two days after committing his final murder, Yu was arrested on the 15th of July, 2004. To evade suspicion of his activities, Yu would call prostitution businesses with different names but they were actually all owned by the same man, Mr. No, this led directly to his downfall. Mr. No thought it was strange that a previous girl had not been heard from after taking a job and thought she may have been kidnapped. Two other women had also gone missing in all after answering calls from the number 6523. No called other nearby massage parlor owners and heard that another woman was missing after a call from the same number. This common phone number belonged to the deceased mother of a missing girl who disappeared in late June. No contacted Inspector Yang from the Mobile Investigation Unit. Sure enough, a call from the same number came in on July 15 at 2 a.m. No contacted his seniors, colleagues and Inspector Yang. The men split up with a woman in a taxi who they would follow to the back of Sink and Grand Mart. Yu called to change the meeting place, and again to complain the woman was too tall and called again for another woman. Meanwhile, Inspector Yang was searching for men's phone numbers in parks and alleys to try and find the culprit. Yu eventually said he liked the third woman they sent and told her to meet in the alley behind the Grand Mart. Yu appeared at the location and the men approached and body searched him. He was handcuffed by Yang who had rushed over and put him in the car. He was suspiciously chewing vigorously and the men tried to stop him and pry his mouth open. Yu was trying to destroy several business strip massage cards. Then his phone fell out, providing one more piece for the puzzle, the last digits of the phone were 6523. Yu Young Chul was transported to Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency's mobile investigation unit, and was treated as a thief for the meantime due to their lack of evidence for the murders. The men who helped in his arrest contributed to the investigation greatly and verified Yu's history of police impersonation. Yu confessed quite quickly to the killings and said he killed 26 people starting with the elderly couple in Sin Sedong to the last woman he killed two days before. While in custody, Yu pretended to have a seizure. Unbelievably his handcuffs were removed and he was left unsupervised with the door open. Talk about letting your guard down. Yu easily escaped and went to his house to destroy evidence. Yu then went to a motel and also bought 360 sleeping pills. Despite his escape, he was captured around 11 to 12 hours later after mobile patrol saw him at a roundabout crosswalk. Upon his second arrest, Yu confessed all of his crimes to the police. 
he confessed that he would talk with his victims for about an hour, asking about their personal lives, before he would kill them. Throughout his time in custody he changed his story many times, but he did agree to lead police to the bodies. During this expedition, he was made to wear a yellow raincoat and a mask to conceal his identity. Hence, the nickname Raincoat Killer, which notably wasn't so commonly used in Korea but more so internationally in the media. Yu's apartment was searched and was reported to be clean and orderly, and he kept an obsessively neat scrapbook. The next confessions take Yu's serial killing spree into another dimension. Yu claimed that he'd eaten some of the internal organs of four of his victims either to cleanse his spirit or to cure his epilepsy. Yu had essentially confessed to cannibalism. There was no solid proof he did consume human flesh but four corpses reportedly had no organs. Yu Young Chul notably said he would have kept killing if he hadn't been caught. One of the criticisms of how the case was handled was regarding the lack of communication between police departments. Typically, the departments would keep to their own districts and wouldn't inform other districts or collaborate with them, so cases weren't easily linked across districts because of this. They also would tend to only make their crimes public once they solved them in order to maximize promotions. The Korean police also tended to rely quite heavily on confessions rather than forensic evidence. These problems, combined with a lack of evidence made solving this case much more difficult and in the end, Yu's capture was mostly thanks to the owner of prostitution services and not the police. The trial begins. Yu Young Chul first appeared in court on the 6th of September 2004, and was being charged on 21 counts of murder. In his first court visit, he apologized to the victim's families while maintaining that he had no intention of stopping the killings. He said he refused to return to court but was back two weeks later where he lunged at the judges. His next court appearance was meant to be on October 4th, however, he had attempted suicide the preceding night by hanging himself from the wall fan in his cell but was stopped by the guards. On October 25th, Yu tried to attack a spectator in the courtroom who was cursing him, and then agreed that he wouldn't cause any further disturbances. Shockingly, he turned to face the victim's families, and while smiling devilishly, said that the women deserved to be captured by him. Finally, on December 13th, Yu Young Chul was found guilty of 20 counts of murder and was sentenced to death. The victim's families were compensated financially by the government due to a law in the country that says if the criminal is unable to compensate the families for the crimes, the government would. Yu is now in the sole detention center on death row, being one of 60 death row inmates. The last execution of criminals on death row was in 1997, and a moratorium was enacted the next year, meaning that no further executions have taken place since then. Interestingly, there was lots of discussion surrounding the abolishment of capital punishment in South Korea, before Yu's arrest but after Yu's crimes came to light, public opinion was swayed to favor the death sentence. So while capital punishment is still permissible and still given out in sentencing, it is not currently in operation. Meaning Yu will likely live out the remainder of his days in prison. The only questions that remain are did Yu tell the truth when he confessed to consuming his victims? And did he really kill 26 victims? If so then why was he only convicted on 20 counts? Thanks for watching, subscribe to the channel, and come back for more gruesome crimes that shook the world.